I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. It's good to have you with us tonight. All you that are here tonight came out. God bless you. Amen. We need more of the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Monday night prayer, two different people had a word, the same word. Beware of counterfeit spirits. Now, I don't know about you, but I went home and I, I just contemplated that and I was in bed and I was tossing and turning and I woke up thinking about that. And uh, I was like, well, God, well, are you trying to tell us something? Is there something we're doing? Always, always, when a word is given, always be introspective first. And I said, God, is it our church? What's going on? And he led me to a, um, a message by David Wilkerson on the counterfeit spirit. And uh, it was an awesome word. And something he said in there that I want to pick out tonight and I want to share with you uh, because I believe it's so important because there's a lot of stuff going on that's claiming to be Christian and it's not. There are a lot that are saying they're Christian, but they're not. There's a lot that are pretending to be Christian and they're not. And um, no matter, I don't care what it looks like on the outside, it's what matters on the inside. I also posted something by uh, Craig uh, Lewis. I don't know if you read you, you got to see that. Craig Lewis, um, he's from EX Ministries. It's on, it's on affirmation. You need, to read, you need to really look at that and really, really listen to what he had to say. It's very, very, very uh, true what he had to say in that, that portion of Scripture when he, that he shared and the things that he shared. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to open up to the Gospel of John. This is something I've never seen before. But it really speaks of today. It really speaks about Christianity today and um, what's going on in the church. And I, I want you to open up to chapter 8 of John. And in this chapter, you know, he's... You saw that the beginning of this chapter that the woman was caught in adultery, you know, and the, the religious bunch said, you know, let's stone her, you know, according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned. And, and he, they asked Jesus, what do you say? And he said, let the one that has no sin cast the first stone. And then Jesus began to speak about him being the light of the world and that he came into the world to, to show forth the Father and then he went on and he, he warns the disciples about unbelief. And uh, I'm going to read from verse 21 to, to verse 29, then, uh, uh, to verse 30 rather, and then I'm going to get into what I want to share with you as it goes further on. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way and you shall seek me and you shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whether I go, you cannot come. He said to them, ye are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. That's very interesting. He was born in the world, but he was not of the world. In the same way as Christians... We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen? We're, we're born again, born from above. We have a, a new father now. We're serving someone different than who we served before. Amen? Then he said to them, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Then said they unto, unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said to them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say to you, um, many things to, to say and to judge of you. So please, when you hear people say Jesus doesn't judge anymore, that's not true. Hello? Come on. He says right here, I've got many things to say to you, 
and to judge of you. He that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And verse 27 says, They understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When you, when you have lift up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Now I want you to underline verse 30. And he spoke, and as he spoke these words, many believed on him. Got that? Many believed on him. I want to make that emphasis. He's in a synagogue. He's preaching this message. He's in the temple. He's preaching this message to both Jews and, and the Jews that believed on him. So there were the Jews that didn't believe and there were the Jews that did believe. Then, let me read it one more time. As he spoke these words, many of the Jews believed on him. Verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Now hear me now. He's talking to the Jews who believe on him. Believe what he said. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. The whole contingency of their belief was tied to continuing in his word so that they could be his disciples. It wasn't just, say, a quick prayer. It wasn't just to uh, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You don't have to do another thing. You can't add to the salvation. We understand that. But what Jesus is saying here, he's saying to those who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples Indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Why did Jesus say that? Why did he bring that point of truth to them, saying that, listen, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free? There's a purpose why Jesus sp specifically chose these words. He didn't just speak uh, uh, words. He spoke these words with a purpose. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Free from what? Verse 33 says, they answered him. They, who are they? The Jews that believed on him. He's talking to the Jews that believe on him now. Right? That's who they are. You're going to see later on in the chapter, the Jews address him. But these are the ones that believed on him. They answered him, we, have, we be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man. How saith thou, you shall be made free? What they were saying here, in, in essence, was that we believe in you, but 
We're already free. What are you talking about? How can you, how can, what's, what's, what are you talking about being free? We were not in bondage to any man. Jesus answered them and said, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now Jesus brings the focus into play and shows them what he's talking about. There are Christians today that it's called easy believism. They go to church, they have a Bible, they know all the Christian lingo, they know everything to say. And they say they believe, just like these Jews, but they're still servants of sin. In fact, John talks about it in, I think, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He talks about it. He that, he, you know, whoever you, you just, your members to, mem yield them to, either members of righteousness or members unto sin. You're going to serve somebody. You may be saying, are you talking about sinless perfection? No. But a true Christian, a true Christian, that is battling with sin, is going to ask for help. He is detested by his sin. He hates his sin. He doesn't want to identify with that sin. He does everything or she does everything to run away from that sin. But today in the church, you have people that are so bound up, yet they say they believe. Jesus says to them, if, conditional clause, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. You are my learned ones. You are learning to forsake the things of the world. You are learning to forsake sin. You're turning away from those things in the world. You're not doing the same things you used to do. You're not going to the same places you used to go. You're not hanging around the same people you used to hang around with. But today, it's not like that. In a lot of the churches today, it's your best life now. It's your best life now. This ain't my best life. My best life's waiting for me in heaven. Hallelujah. Where I have a mansion, where I have streets of gold I'll be walking on. I'll be in the presence of God all the time. I won't have to have any more sorrow, any more pain, any more tears. That's my best life. Not here. I'm going to suffer down here. I'm going to go through persecution. I'm going to go through trials and tribulations. I was listening to Brother David today a little bit. He was giving his testimony about how there was people in his church, people that he led to the Lord, that something happened in his church. And when they found out he had insurance, they sued him for $44 million. And he went through a whole court battle for five years, and it was terrible. I think it was five years, and he, just terrible, terrible things were being said that were not true and all these other things. And, he said, be careful. He said, because when you touch God's anointed, and, then, and they're, not, they're innocent, they're not, real, they're not guilty. He said, every single one of them withered up. They came to nothing. And he said he was driving his car after he got the verdict from the, from the jury and stuff that, you know, they found him innocent in the church, innocent. He pulled over and he said, Lord, thank you. Thank you. And the Lord said to him, I could have done that five years ago. And he went, what? He said, you let me go through all of this for five years? Why? He said, I want to see how you would love your enemies. We're going to go through things in life, but it's how our attitude is toward the ones that are really doing the things that are happening to us. That's what God's looking at. Not that he's going to let them go free. He didn't. He says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They got all puffed up. 
uh, we have not been in any bondage with, son, with children of Abraham. We haven't been in bondage to anyone. And then he says in verse 35, and, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. In other words, what the Apostle Paul said echoed exactly what Jesus was saying here. Sin will not have dominion over you. For you're not under law, but you're under grace. He also said in chapter 5 of Romans, he said, Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Why? Because he that is dead to sin no longer lives in it. Hello? Hello? I'm not saying you, you may not sidestep once in a while. No, because we all have, have different things that things come up. Sometimes we, we're not, we don't do it. We make the wrong decision. But when we do make those wrong decisions and we do sin against God, we're quick to repent of that thing. We go to God and we're sorry and we feel guilty. We feel remorse. We feel sorry. We say, God, I'm, I don't want this in my life. God, take it out. You know, you come to the altar. You plead with God. You you come for prayer, you want, you want somebody that's going to pray with you and somebody's going to pray you through. Remember, these were Jews that believed. I want to emphasize that. He's talking to the whole temple crowd, but these Jews are responding back to him and talking to him. Look, we'll keep, keep going on. He says in verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed. But you seek to kill me. Wait a minute. These are the ones that believed. I never saw that before. These are the ones that said they believed. See, a person can say they believe, but your words and your actions are going to speak what is really true. Because if you're saved, and you're really saved, and you really believe, you're not the same person you were. If you're really a Christian, you're really saved, then it's not my will, Lord, but thy will be done in me. But that's not what you hear today in a lot of the messages. What you hear today is you can have your, your life. You can be a Christian, accept Jesus, and live your own life and make your own choices and make your own decisions. Where does it say that in the Bible? I never knew any slave that could make their own decisions with their master. Hello? Is he your Lord? Is he your master? They called him master. Paul says, I am a bond slave. The Greek word is doulos. A slave by voluntary action, not by force or someone who has is, is made it so that you had to be a slave. But when you came to Christ, when you gave your life to Christ, you put down your will, you put down yourself, like Paul said, I'd die daily. You put that aside and you say, God, it's not my will. It's not my choices in my life anymore. God, it's your choice. It's your will for my, for my life. He says, you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Many Christians have the word up here. They can quote Genesis to Revelation. They can tell you all about They can preach sermons. They can do all kinds of things. But how you know a genuine Christian is by looking at their life and you see the word of God is living inside of them. You see that the word of God comes alive to them. They love the word of God. He's telling them. He 
Because my word has no place in you. Yet you believe. You say you believe on, on me. But your actions. You say you're in no bondage to no man. And I'm not talking about a natural bondage. When I said, he whom the Son sets free, Jesus said, he says, I'm talking about sin. He, he clarifies that in the verse. He says, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. My word has no place in you. Yet they're saying they believe on him. How many times you talk to people out there, and they're not a Christian, but they say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Talk to a Muslim, they believe in Jesus. But have they been born again? You don't hear that expression anymore. Have you been born again, or do you just come to church? Because when you're born again, God takes you out of the kingdom of darkness and places you into the kingdom of his dear son, the Bible says. The kingdom of God comes by the spirit of Christ and lives inside of you. And that spirit is the one that convicts you. That spirit is the one that changes you. That spirit is the one that talks to you and tells you, no, this is wrong. Or tells you, no, this is the way. Walk ye in it. It's up to us to choose. These were believers. They believed in Jesus. He says, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Uh-oh. So Jesus says to them, listen, I'm telling you what my father says, and you're doing what your father says. So apparently, they don't have the same father, but yet they believe on Jesus. Hello? Look at this. They answered and said unto him, verse 39, Abraham is our father. <laughs> now they claim inheritance, inheritance, you know, the natural line. Just because you're born in the natural doesn't mean you're born again. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot, say the word cannot, enter the kingdom of God, or cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. Not just born of the water, but born of the Spirit. I'm telling you, you don't hear this message like this today. All you hear is, come to Jesus, he'll solve all your problems, you'll have all, all, everything you need, he'll bless you, you'll have a wonderful life. No, you won't. <laughs> how many here have a wonderful life? Just, just raise your hand, I want to I I know the secret to your success. Do you have any problems, aggravations, things you go through, disappointments, rejections? Come on, somebody. I'd rather go through these things with Jesus than to go with these things without Jesus. I'd rather be in the boat with Jesus, even though the storm might be raging and the boat is tossing and turning and the waves are coming up and the boat's getting filled with water. I'd rather be in the boat with Jesus than to be in a boat in a storm without Jesus in the boat. Because I know that if Jesus is in the boat, ain't nothing going to happen. He's going to preserve me. He's my life preserver. Hallelujah. 
We have Abraham as our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children. Wait a minute. Hold a time out. Aren't the Jews in the lineage of Abraham? Yet Jesus is saying to them, if Abraham were your father, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. What did Abraham do? Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. He believed in the promise. Hear me now. Listen to what I'm saying to you. God promised him a son. Come on. And all those years, you believe God. Hebrews testifies to that. He said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. In other words, you would see what he saw. And you would believe what he believed. He said, but now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth. I want you to understand, when you tell the truth, when you come eyeball to eyeball with what is false, what is not real, what is an imitation, and you speak the truth, oh boy. They're going to want to kill you. They'll call you every name in the book. They'll come against you as hard as they can. You know why? Because they've just been exposed. See, the truth will make you free. If you want to be free. Look what he says here. He says, I've told you the truth, which I have heard of God, and this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Whoa. Don't you know who you're talking to, Jesus? You're talking to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't go all the way from Jacob. He went all the way back to Abraham. They were saying they knew the promises of Ab that God gave to Abraham. Look at this. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. They're still belligerent. If they believed that he was the Messiah, if they really believed that, and I'm sure they did, but they couldn't wrap their head around truth. Verse 42, he says this. Jesus said unto them, if, conditional now, if God were your father, you would love me. Wait a minute. These are the Jews that believed on him. Isn't that what the word says? Doesn't the word say these the Jews that and there were many Jews that believed on him? But see, when you stop pointing out truth, when you bring the truth and it begins to expose the lies and the hypocrisy, man, they're gonna come up. 
He said, if God were your father, you would love me. Remember Peter when he messed up? And then Jesus came to him and he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter responded, you know that I love you, right? Then he goes back and he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. And a third time he goes back and says, Peter, do you love me? And he goes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, we would just read that scripture. But you understand this, this, there was two different kinds of love that Jesus was talking about. The first one, Jesus asked him, do you agape me? unconditionally do you love me unconditionally Peter Peter says Lord you know that I phileo you the phileo love is a love of friendship not an agapeo agapeo is unconditional love then Jesus went back and said Peter do you agape me and he says you know Lord I phileo you and then Jesus the third time says Peter do you phileo me? And he says, Lord, you know all things. I love you, Lord. I phileo you. And he said, feed my sheep. In other words, do what you're supposed to be doing. If you love God, you're going to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. Come on, somebody. He said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Jesus was God. Hello? He said, I proceeded forth and came from God. Wait a minute. Wasn't he born of a virgin? Didn't he go nine months in Mary's womb and then he was born? What was he talking about? I came from God. Remember in Genesis, when God made creation, what does it say? And God said, let there be light. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. What does John 1, 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, and the, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. He says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then verse 14 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. He said, I didn't come of myself. He sent me. That blows the Jesus-only doctrine right out the door. He said, I didn't send myself. My Father, God, sent me. Hello? Why do you not understand my speech? even because you cannot hear my word. And then he clarifies who their real father is. You are of your father, what? The devil. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They believed on him. They believed on him. So just believing isn't enough. Let me clarify that it's not talking about your salvation, that the price needed to be paid. You couldn't pay one penny of it. 
Christ paid it all. But he did say, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples. It's not this easy believism. Oh, I'm saved and go out and live your life and do your thing. Go where you want to go. Come on. Disobey the word. Disobey instruction. Throw wisdom behind you. Throw, un throw understanding behind you. Don't listen to the preacher preaching the word for you to instruct you. Come on. You go out and do your own thing. He says, you are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father, you will do. Woo. Come on. Look what he says here. He was, meaning the devil, a murderer from the beginning. It was Satan that was the murderer. When did he do that? When did, when did the enemy murder someone? Cain and Abel. Cain led his jealousy and envy. Why? Because he did not allow God to tell him or to instruct him through his parents, the way to approach him. He wanted to approach God the way he wanted to. God said, you come into my presence, you must come through the throne of grace. How do you come through that, that throne? How do you come to that throne? Through grace. Where does grace come from? Grace and truth comes through Jesus. Jesus gave us that through his blood, shedding on the cross. So now we can go in because we have a blood covenant with God. Come on, somebody. Oh, I feel the over here. You have a blood covenant with God. And in that blood covenant, you said to God, God, come in and be Lord and master of my life. You made that covenant with God, and you cannot take that back and still walk in that covenant and be covered by the blood. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and you're going to fulfill the lust of your father. You will do it. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth. Everything that happened from Adam to Malachi, from Genesis to Malachi, all spoke of the coming Messiah. All of the feasts that Israel went through was a type of bringing them to the knowledge of that the Messiah was coming. When Jesus came on the scene, he was the first fruits. Hello. He was our Passover. He was the light, the menorah. He was the anointing that breaks the yoke. The oil in the tabernacle. Anyone who abides not in the truth is listening to the wrong spirit. Today, you see it in the pulpit. You see it in the congregations. Making excuses. For sin. Not dealing with it. Not agonizing over it. Not forsaking it. He says, You are of their father, the devil, and he filled the lust thereof. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth, 
Because there is no truth in him. And what's sad and breaks my heart is many of the uh, seeker-friendly churches today, they don't talk about these kinds of messages. They don't tell the people about sin. They don't tell people about hell. They don't tell about how God will, will, will throw you into hell. God will put you in hell? No, God don't put you in Yes, he does. Read your Bible. He said, fear not the one that can kill the body, but fear the one that can kill body and throw you into hell. That was God, not, not the devil. We don't know our Bibles. It says, and he, he and abode not in the truth. If you don't abide in the truth, and the devil comes along just like he does to Eve, God may be speaking something to you tonight about an area of your life. And the devil says, no, no, it's okay. God forgives you. It's okay. It's, you're all right. Don't worry about it. He's going to lie to you because he doesn't abide in truth. He's a lie from the beginning. He's the father of lies, the Scripture says. Look what it says. He abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, he procreates it. He creates the lies. Oh, you're okay. Don't worry. You'll make it. He said, and because I tell you the truth, you believe not, me not. After he was done all saying that, look at verse 48. It says, then answered the Jews. Now, now he's talking to the Jews, the unsaved Jews. And said unto him, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Now they're saying that Jesus has a devil. Can I tell you something? Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Where's that today? Where are the preachers that will stand up and preach the truth and, and speak the truth, and you hear it all the time? Well, they're, that, that church over there, they judge. They judge everybody. You know, they're judges, and, you know, come on. They, 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 don't, they don't have love. Oh, I, I'm supposed to love you if the bridge is out and not warn you that the bridge is out so to save your life? You're going down the road, you can't see it over the hump. Going over the hump, there's a bridge, and that bridge is out. And, and if you go over that top of that mount, that bridge, that uh, road, you're going to go down into the gully and kill, get killed. And I'm just going to stand on the side of a, a road with a sign that says, it's okay, brother, I love you. It's okay, sister, I love you. That's not love. Love is wanting you and letting you know you're not on the right path. Loving you is telling you what you don't want to hear, but what you need to hear. And yet they have all the big churches and they have all the finances and they have everything they need. Hello? Come on, somebody. My Bible tells me narrow is the way and few there be that find it. Many is brought as the way that leadeth to destruction, and many go in thereat. Because you know what? When they come face to face with truth, they can't handle the truth. So truth exposes, truth reveals. Hello? And once you. You say no to that truth, you are listening to the wrong spirit. Come on, somebody. Timothy, the book of Timothy says this, in the latter days, many shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and they will not love the truth nor the way of salvation. That is happening in our day. 
How the devil's getting people away is through seducing them, seducing them with their lie, with his lies. Here's one of them. You can be a Christian and still live in the life that you lived before you were a Christian. You don't need to change. It's all been paid for. Grace covers it all. So grace covers everything. So you don't need to you don't need to worry about anything, you know. Uh, your past, present, and future sins are all forgiven, so why even bother? You don't even have to come. And some preachers are even preaching this. You don't even have to confess your sins anymore because it's all covered under the blood. So you can still continue to sin and live in your, your life the way you want to because God's got it all covered. <clears throat> That's not what my Bible tells me. Let's look at, um, I got another scripture. I got it on here, though. Let me get it. Hebrews 12, 14. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men as much as possible. <clears throat> Follow peace with men and what? You don't hear too much about holiness anymore, do you? But he says, without peace and without holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, can you put that up in the American Standard Version? Follow after peace with all men and the, the sanctification. Without which no man shall see the Lord. What is sanctification? It's a process. It's a giving of yourself over to the Holy Spirit to work those things out of you and to work the cross in, in you. I've always said that the Holy Ghost will always bring the cross into play in your life. You know, we want the gifts of the Spirit and, you know, the power gifts and all that stuff, but the Holy Spirit, main job, main job, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit is given to do what? Judgment. To convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So if that's to convict the world of the sin of righteousness and judgment, righteousness and judgment, how come it's not being preached? All it is is love, 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 love. God loves you. Love, 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 love. Does it say that the Holy Spirit is going to convict you with love? Where is that scripture? Is it John 16 or John 14? Where is that scripture? Someone find that scripture for me. Or is it 14? Is it 16? Huh? No. Um, wait a minute. 16, 7? Hold on. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Uh, John 16, 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world or convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Okay, that means when the Holy Spirit comes, right? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Has the Holy Spirit come? Day of Pentecost, right? So let me ask you the question. Holy Spirit is invisible, right? How does he, how does he reprove? How does he correct? Huh? How does the Holy Spirit do that? Didn't Paul tell Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? And he in another portion of scripture says, rebuke those who sin. He does it through the leadership. He does it through Christians. 
Come on, somebody. That's how the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's gifts, who do they operate through? Believers, Christians. How does the Holy Spirit operate? Through believers. Now, he can speak one-on-one -on -one to you personally, yes. But sometimes we second-guess the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will speak something, oh, was that me or was that the Holy Ghost? Was that me? But you know what? And I said that to the Lord. I said, Lord, two different people had that word, beware of counterfeit. And I said, is that word true? He said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I said, good enough for me. We have to be able to listen and hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. So, see, you can be a believer in Jesus and still be of your father, the devil. They would not conform to the discipleship of Jesus. They wouldn't believe the truth of Jesus. They question his word. We're not in bondage to anybody. <laughs> Always questioning the word, twisting the word, making the word say something to fit their lifestyle so they can continue in their sin. That's even more dangerous. To twist God's word so, so that you can continue in your sin. I think I told you this when, years ago when I was going to Brother Norman's church. There was a woman there, and she said, um, I'm so excited. I got a testimony. And we were talking, you know, we were outside the church. And she said, oh, I got such a good testimony. She said, uh, uh, I'm going to divorce my husband and go marry this other guy. And someone asked her, well, how can you justify that? She said, well, the Bible says he, take, he taketh away the first to establish the second. That's talking about covenants. It's not talking about husbands. <laughs> But see, you can make it say whatever you want it to say to justify your lifestyle. But God says no. Why is he talking to us this way? Why is he speaking these things to us today? Because he wants us to be right because he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Sometimes you might feel like you're on his ironing board. And he's pressing you. He's getting those things out of your life that need to be taken out of your life because he's getting you ready for his return. Come on, somebody. Oh, I'm sure there's a nice Methodist church somewhere you can go sit. I'm sure there's a nice congregational church or Episcopalian church you can go sit or a Catholic church you can go sit right down the street. Yeah. And you'll be happy in your sin. You think you're, you know, you got it all together. But we ain't got it all together. We still got a long way to go. But we have a desire and a heart to want to serve God. We have a desire to want to forsake sin and walk after his ways. That's got to be in you if you're a real Christian. And you're not going to give up, and you're going to be persistent, and you're going to come to this altar, and you're going to pray before God, and you'll say, God, I'm not leaving till you bless me. Oh, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. That's what Jacob did. He wrestled with that angel. Man, think about that. He was a human being, and here's an angel with supernatural power. And here he is wrestling with that angel. You're stupid, you know. Hey, you know. Here he is wrestling with this angel like he's going to win. That's like me getting into the ring with Mike Tyson. I don't even think I'd last 10 seconds. As the Italians say, bada bing, bada boom, that would be it. And here he's wrestling with this angel. And it's starting to get light out. And, and uh, the angel says, you've got to let me go. I've got, I've got to leave. And he says, no, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. That's persistency. He was persistent. He said, I'm not letting you go. Now the angel could have just 
I'm not letting you go until you bless me. I'm not letting you go until you bless me. That's going to be the heart of a Christian that's struggling with things in their life. God, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting the devil lie to me and tell me I've got to live the rest of my life like this. I've got to have this thing holding over my head. I, I'm not going to do it. God, your word says that sin will not have dominion over me, and I'm going to be free because you said who, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And whoever you are a servant to obey... He said it right in this scripture. They that are servants of sin are slaves. Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. That word committeth is something that's in the present imperative in the Greek, which means it's, it's something that you'd keep doing over and over and over and over and over and over again. Come on, somebody. You're a servant to that thing. And you don't have to be. I don't have to be. God can set us free. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. I hope that's helped somebody tonight. It takes a little more than just believing. If you continue in my word... Then are you my disciples indeed. And I love this. You will know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. But in order for you to know that truth, you've got to be willing to be discipled. You've got to be and take on the, per, the, the personality of a, of a pupil and a teacher. You've got to allow God to teach you. You've got to be teachable. Come on. You've got to love truth. The Bible says no lie is of the truth. Don't walk in a lie. I said this on Facebook. If you look like the world, you dress like the world, you speak like the world, you ain't saved. If you stand beside a person and, and you see how weird they are, and you're weird like them, you dress like them, you talk like them, hey, yo, whoa, what you up? Wow, yeah, bro, 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 bro. You ain't saved. You're identifying with the world. The Bible says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Let's start acting like and looking like Christians. I'm not telling you you're going to wear things up to your neck and you're going to wear long dresses. and Man, you're going to wear shirts all tied up so nobody sees your hair. I'm saying that. I'm saying, come on, let's, let's take those words seriously. We don't want any counterfeit spirit. We don't want to just move along, you know. And, and counterfeit spirit is one like I just described today. You believe, but you don't let the Word of God change you. Hallelujah. This is good stuff. Not because I'm preaching it, but it's because it's the truth. How we need the truth. We need the truth. Heavenly Father, we need truth. Thank you for sending your Son who is the truth. Help me, Lord, to apply the, the things in my life that you're still revealing to me. Things that need to change. Things that you're bringing conviction of. Because there's only one perfect, and that's Jesus. And you're changing us from glory to glory.